today. Anyway, wakune mahi o te wā nei, uh, tupuāne he mihi mai o hāki a tātou manuhiri, uh, Jim, no te USA, no Seattle, and me ki uh, tāku mihi ki a koutou. Koutou ngā hāpori, ngā kaimahi o te kaunehera rohe, uh, ko whakapiri mai nei kei runga i tēnei kaupapa. Uh, hei whakamohi o tātou ngā huatanga o uh, welcome, welcome everyone, and a very warm welcome to you, Jim. All the way from Seattle, my great auntie actually lives in Seattle, but I haven't been to Seattle yet. Got to come. We were very close. <laughs> Vancouver. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? That's only across the border. Um, you've all read Jim's background. Um, he arrived yesterday and I happened to be at the airport as well so we greeted each other and thanks to um, um, Ewood <coughs> and where's Miss <laughs> uh, for their um, support and the welcome at the airport but hey thanks to the community to our community that's come together today um, to learn about how we can actually another way of doing things I'm not quite sure whether it's going to be better but another way of doing things because Jim has a wide experience in, um, in community partnerships uh, between local government and government. Um, they've got so many steps of government over there, it's, um, I'm not quite sure whether it's confusing. But the important thing is actually to have that community participation. And um, we're, we're very keen on that. Um, there's going to be another meeting in Elgin this afternoon. The one at 4 o'clock. One, one at 4 o'clock. And we've had a breakfast um, meeting at the Emerald Hotel overlooking the river, and there was quite a few um, business people participating in that as well. So thank you, Jim. I know that you might be a bit weary from your travels. I hope that they pay for a reasonable fare uh, for you to come over here. But we're looking forward um, to what you have got to share with us. And it's a great world. This is a very, it's, it, as much as it's um, tyranny by distance, it's actually a very close, um, close world. I went to a, a little seminar a little while ago, or last week actually, and the, the, thing, the big thing about today and 100 years ago is actually time. How quick things actually happen. Like it probably um, took three or four days to come from Hicks Bay to Gisborne. Now it's two and a half hours. It used to be on, um, you fly pigeons to, to um, take your messages during the war or or to communicate with each other or fires or something like that. But now at a push of a button you can get into trouble. So uh, <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> so time is um, the tyranny of um, um, issues nowadays. And somehow some people say we still haven't got enough time. Okay. Things are travelling so fast and things are happening so fast and things can go viral very quickly. But Jim uh, welcome. Thank you. That's my Hollow. Uh he can a table here with the Fiji. Welcome to the first city in the world to greet the sun. Even though some people have tried to shift the back line. <laughs> <laughs> they can still not get forty six thousand people. So they thought they don't turn up. Wonderful to be here. Really wonderful. I, I arrived late last night, so I couldn't say a thing. And then this morning we had the uh, workshop up on the fourth floor of the Emerald, and so I looked out on the beautiful th the three rivers, the bay, uh, and Mary took me on this uh, walking tour. What an incredible ambassador she is for this city. She's just so <laughs> proud, and for good reason. Just all the heritage buildings that are still intact, the wonderful palm trees. I just love the clock tower. Uh, and I'm eager to see the rest of the city. Just, just got a little taste of it in between sessions. Um, so, um, before we start, I'd really like to find out who's in the room. Um, so, if you do, a real quick Mexican wave. Okay? <laughs> so, if you just stand up. Hi! I'm in, my name's Jim. I'm from Seattle. And, um, so, just say who you are, um, what you do, and if there's any in particular you'd like to get out of this workshop, okay? So let's just go real fast, real fast away, okay? He did from JSA and I'm just here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you just put it all together, that's all. Yeah. But thanks, good start. Judy from Good Phone to Center. Great, great. Jillian from Karate Center. Great. Yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Jim, Jim, what I want out of today is actually 
actually your blueprint. Okay. Make sure you leave your blueprint behind. Okay, great. I'll do that. Ryan Lane from the Heritage Place, and I want to learn more about working with our community. Great, great. Andy, I'm a district councillor, and I just want to learn about those community partnerships that we have kids in the work. Great. Uh, Kylie from the council, and she has just worked with the community and all the other projects. Yeah, true. Yeah, right. Volunteer Cancer Society, and I'm here to party and 
take everything off you. All right, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> Community Health Advisor, and I'm here for the Community Party. Great. All right, all right. Good, everyone. Tui, Health Promotion TDH. Great. Hey, John, it's Meredith. I've got a round here to party, start the party, and learn how to party in lots of places. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Jade. <laughs> I'm here to videotape the party um, so that we can look back on it um, a little bit later on um, for anything that we forget. I'm from the heart of Gisborne, um, so I'm here on behalf of the business community um, to also learn about um, how we can all work together as well. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Kia ora, I'm from the Parent Campaign. Um, we do the talk about parenting programs, and so I'm here to promote the Parent Campaign with Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love this group. It's great. Can we get everybody? God, it's fantastic. Great cross section of the community. Oh, right. yeah. No, I have any from the UC. Party parties and chill organizers parties. All right. I love parties and chill Oh, my God. This is great. Okay. Wow. Great turnout. And I just love that we have people from so many different sectors in the community. This is fantastic. So um, I'd like to start off. This is Seattle. For those of you who don't have, how many of you have been to Seattle? All right, great. Well, the rest of you got to come. <laughs> we know how to 42. So I want to talk about, I think there's, I was so glad to hear so many people say their passion for community and about their uh, passion for building partnerships with the community. Because I think it's absolutely critical now. And I think there's several things that are kind of waking us up to why community is so important. And the first one is that we're facing some incredible crises. I think we've got a crisis of democracy. Where people, fewer and fewer people are voting. Right? And more and more people are thinking of themselves as taxpayers rather than as citizens. In my country, a lot of people, you know, Tea Party, seeing government as the problem. I used to be a community organizer in the tradition of Barack Obama. And I was always fighting City Hall, bringing people together in low income communities to have a voice. And I love local government because it was an easy target. <laughs> so we had lots of demonstrations. Uh, the mayor, who, well, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> when you're done. Uh, but, um, and I think part of the problem is we need to change how we do our work in government. That uh, I saw some great signs when I walked into City Hall about providing good customer service. And that's absolutely critical. When I first came to local government, uh, Ted Gaylord has written his book called Reinventing Government. It's about how do we reinvent government to be more, more business-like, right? And as a result, now we often call the, the general manager the CEO. We have benchmarks. We try to act like a business. And we, provide, we try to provide really good customer service. And I saw your whole statement about uh, providing good customer service, which is really important. But if we stop there... And just treat people as customers, the inverse relationship is they think of themselves only as taxpayers. And absolutely every form of government has taxpayers. There are taxpayers in dictatorships. Only democracies have citizens. So if we want to bring back our democracy and revive it, we need to, in addition to providing good customer service, also value citizen participation. Recognizing that citizens bring incredible knowledge, perspectives. They can really um, um, add to the expertise that's within the bureaucracy and the elected officials so we get the best possible outcomes when you combine uh, the community's knowledge with government's knowledge. But in addition to that, we also need to be open to community empowerment. And here's what I see as the difference between citizen participation and community empowerment. Citizen participation is about involving citizens in the government's priorities through the government's programs and processes, where government still has all the power. And there are many cases where that's appropriate. You don't want neighborhoods uh, one block at a time finding a transportation system, right? You want the government to do that, but you get much better outcomes if you consult people in the communities before you do that fine. But there are so many things that could be best done by the community themselves. So we also need to be open to supporting the community's <coughs> own priorities through the community's own associations. So we support community initiatives and not always expect the community to be involved in our priorities. The second major crisis we're facing is a crisis of the economy. 
where the very time where people's needs are the greatest, our local government, our nonprofits have the fewest resources to respond. Uh, I just see this all over the world right now. Huge budget cuts in local government everywhere and in our nonprofit organizations. And so nonprofits and government are starting to, to move beyond this map of our places. These are, this is the traditional map that agencies have had of our communities where they focus on all the problems, all the ways it can be helpful. We often say that agencies need needs. Thank God there are, there are problems in the community or a lot of people here would be out of work, right? <laughs> and thank God we have agencies because there's some things communities don't do so well. There's a reason we need government. There's a reason we need nonprofit organizations. But over time, this has become our sole map of the places with which we work. And we've forgotten about this map in the same place, which are all the strengths that are in our communities, all those underutilized resources that are the basis for real partnership. And people are starting to rediscover this map now because of the economic crisis. People are realizing there's tons of un underutilized resources in our communities. And we're starting to pass those. The third crisis we're facing is the crisis of climate change. And I think people are starting to realize that we aren't going to deal with climate change just through inventing more green technology. People have to actually adopt it. And people will only adopt it and live in a more responsible way if they feel some connection with one another in the places they share. If we just think of ourselves as individuals, what difference does it make if I don't recycle, if I waste gas, I'm one person on this huge planet. But it's in community that we take some accountability. It's in community that we recognize that collectively our actions are going to make a difference. So there's absolutely no substitute for community when it comes to dealing with climate change, dealing with the environment. I want to share a story from one of our neighborhoods in Seattle about the power of community to care for the earth. This is um, a program based on a, 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 a program I'll talk about a little bit more later called the Neighborhood Matching Fund, where we provide a cash match from city government in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor in support of a community-initiated project. So this project happened in our Ballard neighborhood. Ballard is the city, the city of Seattle has about 600,000 people, but our neighborhoods have about 5,000. So that's the scale I'm talking about. Ballard was the neighborhood in Seattle that had the least number of street trees of any neighborhood in Seattle. They also had the fewest number of parks outside of downtown. And there was a woman in Ballard named Gervilla Gowan. She cared passionately about trees. She wanted to see trees up and down the streets. So she put notices in her church bulletin. She put notices in the local paper, the Ballard News Tribune, advertising for other people who shared her passion for trees. And she tried to find somebody in every block in Ballard. And if nobody came forward, she'd go to that box, she'd knock on the door until she convinced somebody that they shared her passion for street trees. <laughs> and then she got that person inside a flight for saying, I'll come to a training about how to plant and take care of the trees, and I'll recruit my neighbors to do the same thing. So she turned in all of her pledge forms with their matching fund application, and one day, trucks pulled into our neighborhood with 1,080 trees, wow. dropped them off at every block in Ballard, Gervilla went and knocked on the door of the block captain and said, the trees are here. Block captain knocked on the neighbor's doors. That day, over 1,000 people came out to plant trees. People felt incredibly empowered. At the beginning of the day, they those street trees. At the end of the day, they had tree-lined streets. So look what we can do if we work together as a community. But they said, we still have the least number of parks of any neighborhood in Seattle. So they walked around the neighborhood looking for potential park sites. Had a hard time finding them because the neighborhood is pretty built out, pretty developed. But they finally found this old rundown house that used to serve as a nursery. Um, and the property was overgrown, huge public safety problem right next to the business district. They convinced the city to buy that property for a park. But the city had no money to design or build the park. So the neighbors did it themselves. Local landscape architect volunteered her services and worked with the other neighbors. And together they designed and built Baker Park, all with volunteers. This is entranceway into the park. There was some beautiful landscaping in this park. There were some nice trees in this park, but one of them, a huge tree had died, and they're trying to figure out how to remove it. And then one of the neighbors, who was Native American, had a better idea and carved it in place as a totem. Oh, and here's some of the detail. So a bear with a frog in his mouth, kind of a symbol for returning nature to the city. This group went on, and the next year they built a community garden. 
This is now one of 85 organic community gardens we have in the city of Seattle. Uh, 7,000 urban gardeners collectively they donate 15 tons of organic produce to our food banks every year. And all these gardens were built by neighbors. This is their most recent park. Uh, this is the site of a former house. So to commemorate the house, they built all the furniture out of cement. <laughs> and at the dedication for this park, they unveiled a timeline that shows the 20 parks they built over the past 20 years. Every one of them with volunteers. They built ball fields. They built playgrounds. They're restoring a salmon estuary. They're renaturalizing natural areas. They work with kids to build a skate park. 20 parks in 20 years. They said, well, this is great. We made our neighborhood a much better place, but we're concerned about what's happening to the planet. We're concerned about climate change. So they organized an all-volunteer group called Sustainable Valor. And they have a big festival every summer. They call it Sustainable Valor Fest. And in their park, in the middle of the neighborhood, they have music and they got food. They have a party to bring people in. And then they have all kinds of booths to educate neighbors about what they can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And the first booth you go to is the undriver's license station, <laughs> where you go and check all the ways you will not drive over the next month. And when you do, you get a laminated undriver's license. <laughs> Julia Fields, the one who organizes this, and she says, I'm going to walk, I'm going to bike, take transit, etc., etc. And when you get your undriver's license, it tells you to drive. The shuffle bus! <laughs> <laughs> this is like a Fred Flintstone mobile. It's a pedal by feet, it's going down the street, it's getting everybody's attention, it gets people thinking, what can I do to get out of my car? What can I do to reduce my carbon footprint? This now has created a movement. All the neighborhoods around Ballard have organized their own all volunteer sustainability groups. All the suburban communities around Seattle have done the same. We now have 67 of these all-volunteer groups, and collectively they call themselves Scallops, Sustainable Communities All Over Puget Sound. And it all started with Derville and Gallup and those street trees. Incredible untapped potential in our communities. And it's the only way we're going to deal with climate change. Second unique power of communities is the power to prevent crime. We could have police officers on every street. We probably wouldn't feel as safe, and it certainly wouldn't be as appropriate as neighbors just watching out for each other. <laughs> police officers can enforce laws, but only communities can prevent crime. This is a story from our uh, Soto neighborhood, which is the warehouse and industrial area just south of downtown Seattle. I wish I had the before picture, because the backs of these warehouses were covered with graffiti. It looked terrible. There was garbage all along the tracks. And it's the first view that tourists and commuters get of Seattle each day, because it's how our light rail comes into the city. Really bad. Mike Perringer here worked in the local factory, and he was sick of this image of his neighborhood. So Mike had a great idea. He says, why don't we see the backs of the warehouses as potential canvases for murals? He called it the Urban Art Corridor. But Mike had an even better idea. He worked with our court system. And he asked the judges, could you offer the kids who get busted for graffiti an alternative sentence where they could come and help us to create the murals? Not an easy decision for the kids because they had to show up at work on time. They had to dress appropriately. They got life skills training. But young people were mentored by professional artists. And young people created every one of these murals. And we found that as long as the kids were involved in this program, not one of them reoffended. The problem in Seattle is you can only paint outdoor murals three months a year because it's raining the other nine months. <laughs> so Mike had another great idea. He got a local warehouse to donate their space. And in there, they create murals and four by eight sheets of plywood. They put those around construction sites to beautify the construction sites. The developers pay for the murals and it keeps the program sustainable over time. So now there have been more than 1,500 murals created through this program and more than 5,000 young people and you don't have to get busted to get into the program. We don't want to create negative incentives. <laughs> <laughs> a third unique power of community is the power to care for one another. I was in Taiwan, uh, the Long Gong neighborhood, where they were so proud of their neighborhood. This is the neighborhood leader, and she created a map of her neighborhood out of fabric. But they had this old uh, building that wasn't being utilized, an old school building, and they turned that into a community center. But it's all run by volunteers. They have a daycare center there, and it, people take turns every day of the week watching after each other's kids. Really cute kids. Yeah. 
They've got classrooms where people in the community are teaching their skills to other community members for free. I walked into this classroom and everybody was just singing their hearts out. It was a music class. And upstairs is the senior center. But the senior center is supported by the neighbors. People supporting their own elders. And where the elders and the young people get to interact within the building. And where they have fantastic food that's cooked by community members. It's community food rather than institutional food. That's the power of community, the power to care for one another. And finally, the power to respond to disaster. Christ Church is our sister city of Seattle. I was there three years ago, beautiful city. I was back there again in December. And I wasn't prepared for the level of devastation I'd seen. I said 90% of the downtown is going to be level. Half, many of the neighborhoods. But what was really amazing to me was the spirit of the people. I talked to local elected officials who said they learned through that earthquake, yeah, it's important to prepare those emergency kits, but there's nothing more important than just knowing your neighbors. Nothing more important. And people often realize it when it's too late. And the creativity and the spirit of the community, despite that incredible disaster, is just amazing. They have vacant lots everywhere, and community members are coming together to create those bumping places that are so critical to building a sense of community. Really creative bumping places. So this is right downtown Christchurch, where they lost a major hotel. And they wanted to create a concert venue to bring people together. All they had were a bunch of old construction pallets. So they built the Blue Pallet Pavilion. It was their opening day. Just a fantastic place with all that greenery growing in it. But that's the creativity that comes out of community, the spirit of community, despite huge tragedies. <coughs> I was another big lot. Somebody had an old washing machine, and they hooked up the, and they put speakers inside it, and you come and connect your iPod, and then uh, you play whatever dance music you want, and everybody comes out and dances. <laughs> in the aftermath of an earthquake, people come together to dance again, to celebrate community. <laughs> Another vacant lot, they painted the wall as a screen. You, you, uh, it's a cycle power cinema, so you ride up on your bicycle and you hook it up to the generator, and as long as your bicycle, the movie keeps playing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic creativity. <laughs> Another vacant lot where they painted the wall and so people could put poetry on the wall. And they do poetry readings here. And this poem really got to me. Amidst the shards of glass and twisted steel, beside the fallen brick and scattered concrete, we began to understand that there is beauty in the broken. Strangers do not live here anymore. And it's so true, people in Christ Church understand the value of community like nobody else. They understand that's, that's the most important thing and are connecting in a way they never have before. So in the same way, I think uh, the community is uniquely capable of dealing with health. There are studies that show that about 15% of health outcomes can be attributed to healthcare professionals. In many ways, our communities have a much bigger impact. They impact our mental health. They impact the social conditions that affect our health, the environmental conditions that affect our health, the economic conditions. They affect our behaviors. All those things that impact our health. Our happiness is dependent on strong communities. The best places are created by strong communities. Social justice. In my country, no major social change has ever come top down. It all happens bottom up. The civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the disability rights movement, the gay and lesbian rights movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, it's all come bottom up. So without strong communities, we can't make change. And our very democracy is